Okay, so um, this is, I start off very simple. So the, 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 the idea, of course, is that uh, all genes are arranged along chromosomes. And um, the theme of my talk, I suppose, is that um, the orientation of genes along the chromosome matters to some extent. Um, because, of course, depending on whether genes are running in the same direction or a tandem or run away from each other, divergent, or run towards each other, convergent, then in principles you can get effects between adjacent genes. And of course, what makes one gene affect the next door gene is very much tied up in the transcription process because of course you initiate transcription at the promoter or P and stop transcription at the terminated T. But um, if that process of starting and stopping is incorrect or aberrant, then you can affect neighboring genes particularly if the termination process is, is defective. And um, I, th I think the title might have been Gene Punctuation, which is one of my okay, favorite simple titles. So the idea is that you need to separate one gene from the next. So you need your punctuation marks, your full stops, your commas, or your terminators. <laughs> um, and so I'm, I'm going to um, talk about various aspects, which are all really to do with this basic cartoon of genes along a chromosome. Um, so, of course, if you fail to terminate, if, if, if the T doesn't work and you read through, then, then the effect is you end up generating a, a read-through transcript, which will actually downregulate or inhibit the next gene. And this, this is a process that we call transcription interference. So if you, if, if you mutate a termination factor or a cleavage poly A factor, you always get a very severe phenotype. And that's usually because lots of genes along chromosomes are being interfered with by the upstream gene running into them. So in, interference is a, a big deal, particularly, particularly when you have very simple compressed genomes like in, in S. cerevisiae or S. pombi. If you, if you, if you mutate a, a termination factor in S. S. cerevisiae, then it, it's, always a, it's always a lethal phenotype, essentially. So, so a, a temperature-sensitive mutation will give you loads of aberrant levels of transcription. Um, so that's what happens with tandem genes. However, if, if, if you're a convergent gene, and you fail to terminate, like in the cartoon down here, then actually what will happen with convergent genes when they fail to terminate is that you can not only get interference by simply the polymerases just colliding with each other so that you end up not expressing either gene properly, but of course the, the other thing that can happen is that you can end up in the same nucleus in, over, the, over the same gene um, generating RNA which is effectively overlapping or double-stranded. And of course, as soon as you make double-strand RNA, then, as you all know, you, you um, immediately elicit the RNAi response and cause um, interference or cause the downregulation of genes by inducing heterochromatin, for instance. And I'll talk about a particular case of this in, um, in S. pombi uh, in, in the second part of my talk. But then um, I've always really focused more on the terminator than the promoter of genes. But um, my lab a few years ago discovered that, in fact, Whenever a gene is transcribed, the promoter and the terminator interact and come together to form what we refer to as a gene loop. And so really, when you, when you, when you study termination, you're also studying initiation. And um, I spent some time since we originally found these gene loops in 2004. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to really understand what their purpose is. We, I mean, we assume because they're there and because they seem to be ubiquitous that there must be some basic transcriptional benefit of forming a loop, but um, proving what that benefit is has, has proved rather hard. But I think we now have some really quite neat data which really does begin to explain why a gene forms a loop when it's been transcribed. And I'll share that with you today. Um, so, on to uh, further cartoons. So just to remind you, of course, that RNA polymerase 2 is a very complex enzyme. Um, and this, this outrageously simplified cartoon doesn't do it justice, but what it does do is remind you, of course, that the POL2 has this um, C-terminal domain of the largest subunit, the so-called CTD, which is highly phosphorylated during transcription. And as you all know, this CTD acts to recruit um, the RNA processing factors that work on the transcript as it's being made. And so the concept in making a message from a, a eukaryotic gene is that the transcript as it's being made is modified, is spliced, is capped, is polydenylated. And so the whole process of, 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 of the whole business of processing transcripts occurs co-transcriptionally. I mean, that, that's the key thing which I think really needs to be 
said over and over again, I think you're going to miss most of the titles of my, of my slides because they're <laughs> somewhere up on the roof, but never mind. <laughs> I don't think it really matters. Well, can, can it be lowered? I don't know. If, if, if it's a simple adjustment, it would be good. I'll continue anyway. Um, so to give you a slightly more detailed cartoon of... So, so uh, as you'll appreciate, um, my lab works very hard on trying to understand the mechanism of transcriptional termination. And so I, I, I'm not going to show you any data because it's all, 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 all published by now. But um, I'll, I'll just show you a few cartoons just to remind you the way we think the termination process actually operates in the eukaryotes. And this is for RNA polymerase 2 transcribed genes. I, I'm not going to talk about RNA polymerase 1 transcription or RNA polymerase 3 transcription. Um, so for RNA polymerase 2 transcription in mammals, probably the, the, um, the, the most general way that the polymerase stops transcribing when it gets to the end of the gene is by this, this process shown in this cartoon here. And so what we have here then is a rather more detailed cartoon of RNA polymerase 2. And so you can now see the, um, the single strand DNA bubble in the middle of the polymerase. And you can see the RNA base paired to the, um, to the um, template DNA strand in the active site. And of course, this, this little, little cylinder here is the nucleotide entry channel. And the other cylinder there is the RNA exit channel. The RNA comes out of the RNA exit channel. And this pre-mRNA is then processed, is capped, spliced, and polydenylated. And these processing enzymes, as, as I've already said, um, find their way to the site of action by interacting with the CTD. And the CTD can be phosphorylated either at serine 5 or serine 2 and also serine 7 positions. I think it's now working, actually. Or maybe, maybe I just well, lowered the... Back and show him what was a there. That was a problem. But maybe it doesn't... If, if it's not fixable, let's not worry about it. I'll just carry on. Because in the monitor, it's OK. So it's just the screen is... It's not visible right now. Yeah. Sorry about that. Don't worry. It's, it's probably the storm last night. <laughs> 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 OK, where was it? OK, yes. Yeah, so, so the basic mechanism of transcriptional termination, we think, is that when the polymerase gets to the end of the gene and it finds the poly-A signal, which is, is a feature of the three prime end of pretty much all POL2 transcribed genes, then factors which are bound to the CTD directly cleave the poly-A site, releasing the message. And of course, that cleavage is coupled to adding the poly-A tail. This is all classic sort of uh, old stuff, before most of you were born, as I was saying. <laughs> um, but then what we now know is that the polymerase keeps on transcribing, and that the end that's generated by cleavage at the poly-A site is then degraded by this exonuclease called, uh, it's got a different name in S. cerevisiae than it has in high eukaryotes. In, in S. cerevisiae, it's called RAT1. And in, in high eukaryotes, it's called XRN2. Anyway, this, this exonuclease chews away the transcript. And it, 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 it appears to be in kinetic competition with polymerase elongation. So if it catches up with the polymerase, it promotes polymerase release. And that's how we think termination in general works mechanistically. But for high eukaryotes, the, the polymerase is elongating at a pretty high speed. And so it, it turns out that it's beneficial to slow down the polymerase at so-called pause sequence. And so the polymerase, when it gets past the poly-A site, probably slows down in terms of elongation rates, pausing, we think, in, very, in general, G-rich elements, which are downstream of the poly-A site. And then this promotes efficient termination. So that's what happens, we think, for many genes in high eukaryotes, and probably pretty much all genes in lower eukaryotes. But it, it turns out that, at least in mammals, we think there's another, another variant method of termination. Which, which involves the polymerase transcribing past the poly-A signal along the DNA template. And then it encounters another region of sequence, which seems to itself induce rapid cleavage, a so-called co-transcriptional cleavage sequence. And this cleavage event occurs very fast. It actually occurs quicker than the cleavage at the poly-A site occurs. And so you, so you end up with a structure where the um, nascent transcript is still bound to the CTD, but you've already cleaved at the CoTC. And the CoTC, because it occurs rapidly, occurs right next to where the polymerase has got to. And so then when you chew with exonuclease, it's the same XRN2 in this direction. You also chew in the other direction with the exosome, which will chew back towards the poly-A site. So these two exonucleases will basically clean up the three prime flanking region transcript and promote termination. But the surprising thing about this mechanism of termination is that the polymerase falls off the chromatin, falls off the DNA template, still not cleaved at the poly-A site. And so the poly-A signal now can so the message, which is still bound to the polymerase, is actually purified from the nucleoplasm as a, a binary complex, which, which hasn't yet been processed at the poly-A site. And in fact, we think that gives an advantage to the 
final processing of the message because, it, because most of the exonucleases which degrade these nascent transcripts are chromatin associated and so by releasing the polymerase with a message still attached it means that a message which has a rather bad polyacite can now be efficiently cleaved in the slower time and not be degraded by these exonucleases. And so, so you end up with a, actually more message if you terminate by this, by this process. So this is already background and if you want to read about it um, we have published um, a lot of rather boring papers on the subject, which you can read. Um, so, what am I going to talk about today? I, I promise to just say two, I'm, I'm just going to show two data sets today, that, that's my promise. Um, I'll probably, probably keep to it. Um, I haven't quite got there yet. Okay, so in, in S. cerevisiae, the mechanism of termination is the same as these two pausing or CoTC type mechanisms I've already introduced from mammals, but in, in S. cerevisiae, there are seen to be some additional tw um, tricks, maybe, maybe which also happen in mammals, but certainly have been well defined in S. cerevisiae. So in S. cerevisiae, we know that termination of transcription for um, POL2 transcribed genes in most cases involves recognition of the poly-A signal and then the torpedo, just as I showed you in, in that previous cartoon. And probably there's pausing, although we haven't really defined it very clearly in, in S. cerevisiae. But we know also in, in S. cerevisiae that a lot of a lot of transcripts, actually usually not messenger RNAs, but made by RNA polymerase II, terminate by a different um, uh, complex called uh, the NRD complex, which contains um, components NAB3 and NRD1, and also a, a, also a helicase called SEN1. And, and all three of these um, proteins have mammalian counterparts. They haven't been well characterized in mammals. Although SEN1, which is the, the one I haven't drawn here, which is part of this complex, in, 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 in higher eukaryotes is called senataxin. And in humans, mutants in senataxin have severe genetic defects. Anyway, so that's a, another mechanism of termination. And then finally, there's, a, there's a, a third way of stopping a polymerase, which is actually cleaving the transcript. It's, it's sort of like CoTC, but in this case, it's actually a hairpin recognized by an enzyme called RNT1, which is very homologous to Drosha, which of course we all know about as, as the key starting point in microRNA biosynthesis. Um, but RNT1 cleavage can indeed promote transcriptional termination, and it does so by allowing a torpedo to get in at this position on the transcript and um, promote polymerase release. And we published uh, this, uh, these observations earlier last year. Um, but I, I'm going to use this RNT1 termination mechanism as, as a trick in, in a later experiment, so that's why I'm showing it to you now. Okay, so back to gene loops. Okay, so that, that's all the sort of preamble about termination. So what about gene loops? Um, we think that any gene, probably any, any gene of any type of polymerase, um, transcribed by any sort of polymerase, will form a loop. You, you actually get gene loops formed with RNA polymerase 1 transcripts as well, we think. Um, but anyway, certainly for POL2 transcribed genes, in general, the... Whoops, I pressed the wrong button there. Um, we think that the promoter and terminator are held together, and some of, the, some of the components that hold the loop together have been defined, particularly in Mike Hampsey's lab. And it's, it's clear that you need TF2B for the loop to form successfully. You also need components of the cleavage and polydenylation complex, which is, is called CPF in, in, in yeast. All these experiments are really in S. cerevisiae, so I'm going to use S. cerevisiae terminology. But um, as you'll see today, um, a component of CPF that we've been looking at in some detail is a protein called SSU72, which has a rather silly name. SSU72 is basically a subunit of CPF. Um, it's interesting in that it has CTD serine 5 phosphatase activity, so it takes off the 5 prime, it takes off the serine 5 phosphate mark from the RNA polymerase CTD. It also interacts closely with TF2B as well as being a component of CPF. And so before we knew about gene loops, it was known that SSU72 appeared to have a double life. It, it, it was part of a, uh, an initiation factor, TF2B, and was also part of CPF. And we now think it's part of both because actually you form the loop. Um, okay, so function of gene loops. Well, um, when we found these things originally, we figured that a gene loop was a good idea because obviously if the polymerase starts at the promoter and goes to the terminator and then it's back at the promoter again, it means you can recycle the polymerase very rapidly from one round back to the beginning again. So it seemed to us as though polymerase recycling would be a likely benefit of having a gene loop. So maybe it's all about efficiency. There, there, isn't, there isn't actually a lot of RNA polymerase II in the nucleus available for all the genes that want it to transcribe them. And so the more efficiently you can 
put the polymerase back in place to retranscribe, the more efficient the nucleus will be. Um, however, um, what I'm going to talk about today is mainly point number two, which is that we think that actually one of the main points of gene loops is actually to tell the polymerase which way to go, surprisingly. So it turns out that polymerase, although it's a very complex and sophisticated um, enzyme, it, it doesn't really know, it, it, it recognizes a promoter. In fact, it doesn't even really recognize a promoter. It recognizes a region which doesn't have any nucleosomes on it. It recognizes a nucleosome-free region. And so one, once, it, once it binds to a, an NR, NFR, as we call it, um, then it'll just go in both directions. And essentially, it, 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 needs, it, it needs a clue as to which is the right direction. And so we think that maybe the gene loop provides that clue. And I'll show you the data for that. Um, there's also another phenomenon, which again I won't talk about today, because I haven't really got enough time unless I go on all afternoon, which is we think that gene loops are also important for a process that we call transcriptional memory. And um, I'll, I'll just show you a cartoon of the memory idea, number three, before I go back into number two. So. Um, my strategy is that um, the memory story for Gene Loops we, we published again um, last year. Um, so you can go read the paper if you want to read more about it. Whilst um, number two is sort of hot new data, which we are in the process of have, it's in the process of being rejected by nature, I suspect. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can you can share the excitement with uh, with the referees, perhaps. <laughs> um, okay, so let's start with memory first. And um, just to, uh, of course, you realize that, uh, like all PIs, I don't actually do any work myself. I just sit in my office and <laughs> try and reject everybody else's others, but <laughs> all the other people's papers rather than my own. Um, but, but my lab is full of very clever people, and the people who did the memory story are Hashi here and Sume Tan Wong. And, uh, and actually, it's, 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 it's kind of amusing because we, we found this, this, this particular story quite hard to get published. We sent it to all the, you know, we started at the top with, you know, the, the journals you dream about. But you ended up with Genes and Development, which was very nice. And, and it turns out Hashi has now got a job as, as, as editor at Genes and Development. <laughs> um, because G&D, as you may know, is, is, is one of the main journals in our field. And it's had a European office and an American office. And the European office is shut down. And now it's all going to be happening in Cold Spring Harbor in America. And Hashi's been taken on as a, a second editor to deal with the extra body of papers. So there you go. Anyway, before she was accepted for the editorial job, um, she and Sume did this very nice piece of work, which is just summarized in a cartoon in the next slide. So what we basically show in these studies is that um, it turns out that in, in S. cerevisiae, at least, and this is probably true of other eukaryotes, a number of genes which are very strongly inducible, which are turned on by a particular induction cue, they have, this, they have this process called transcriptional memory, which means that if they're induced and then the inducer is taken away, if the inducer isn't taken away for very long, like only maybe in the case of S. cerevisiae, a few hours, then when you re-induce, the induction process is more rapid. And so the idea is that this transcriptional memory makes the, the yeast more efficient at dealing with common environmental changes, essentially. And so what we showed in these studies is, is, is that for inducible genes in S. cerevisiae, and the inducible genes we use are the ones everybody uses, which are the, the gal-inducible genes. Um, and we actually did most of the work here on hexokinase, which is a gal-inducible gene in S. cerevisiae. And we showed that the hexokinase gene forms a gene loop when it's, when it's transcribed, like all genes do. But in particular, we showed that this particular gene loop um, interacted with nuclear pore components, in particular a protein called MLP1 or myosin-like protein 1. And we show that if you knocked out MLP1, although the loop still formed, you, you didn't get this memory effect, which you normally see with genes which are highly inducible. So even though it had been previously induced in galactose for, for a gal-inducible gal gene, and then the inducer was taken away, it, 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 took, it took a long time to be reinduced unless it still maintained this association with the nuclear pore. Okay. And so I won't show you all of the data, which um, would occupy the next hour if I did. Um, but, but simply what we showed was that um, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you have the gene grown under inducible conditions, then you, then you form a loop which is associated with the nuclear pore. If you then repress this for a short period of about 60 minutes, then the polymerase falls off the gene immediately. And you can see that by pol 2 chips. But the loop still remains in place. You can still pick up 3C interactions between the beginning and the end. And this, and, this, and this holding on to the loop, even after the polymerase has fallen off, requires this nuclear pore component called MLP1. And then if you reinduce again, then you rapidly turn on the gene at high levels. 
If, however, you repress for a longer period than 60 minutes, which is down here, like if you repress for four and a half hours, then it takes much longer to reinduce, and then MLP1 doesn't have any function. And so it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's kind of a, it seems like an adaption of gene loops to a particular biological process, which may be very important for single cell organisms, which have to rapidly respond to environmental changes because they don't have the benefit of being multicellular, basically. Okay, so that was published in GND um, last year, so that's the story there. And in fact, the nice thing about this study was that we did it neck and neck with um, Mike Hampsey's group in the States, and so we both published together in GND, and the fact that we both came to independently the same conclusion was kind of satisfying. It probably means it's right. <laughs> in fact, the curious thing about science is that the second paper of, of any big discovery is always the most important paper, because the first paper is probably, you know, the authors have pushed it as hard as they possibly can to get the thing published, and you know it's probably partly made up in some cases anyway. <laughs> um, but when you see the second independent paper, you know it's really true. But but the but the sad irony is the second paper is often impossible to get published because the journals say, well, this is boring. We've, it's already been it's been preempted by the first paper. So, so it's the wrong way around. You really should give the first paper a hard time and only send it to a very obscure journal, and then the second paper should be in cell. <laughs> Don't you think? <laughs> uh, anyway. So the, the answer is to co-publish with the other competitors, because then, because then you both get your papers into cell. That, 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 that's, that's the way to do it. <laughs> OK, so now we're going on to transcription direction. And here I will show you some data. And this is, this is the combined work, again, of Sue May, and also a very talented French postdoc in my lab, although he comes from the Basque country. So I don't know that he regards himself as entirely French. But anyway, sort of French. And he's, he's married to a Swiss lady as well. So anyway, that's, he, he, he's very European. And he's called Yergi Kamlon. And um, so what we've been doing in these experiments is, and we've also, we've gone omic big time, which is a bit of an anathema to me because I'm, I'm rather worried about all these modern technologies. But we, we, we've had to rely on a chap called Lars Steinmetz for arrays and bioinformatics, as you'll see in a minute. OK, so we come back to Suzu 72. So you remember I said that Suzu 72 is a, a component of the cleavage poly A factor. It's also a component of TF2B. And we think it's very much at both ends of the gene because of the um, gene loop formation. And um, as I said already, it's a, it's, it's a CTD um, serine 5-phosphatase. So it counteracts uh, the kinase that normally puts on this 5' prime transcription mark. And, and if you knock it out, you don't cleave and add a poly tail anymore. So it's, it's absolutely required for the biochemistry of cleavage and polyadenylation. And its human homologue hasn't really been characterized, although it does exist. OK, so here is, here is some 3C analysis. So um, the way you show that a loop forms is by this technique, which is, is sort of like a chip, except uh, it has some differences, clearly. Um, so you, you basically isolate chromatin, you formaldehyde crosslink. Then instead of sonication, you cleave with a restriction enzyme, and you choose an enzyme which cuts at regular intervals along your gene. You then take this. Um, cross-linked restricted chromatin fraction and dilute it to a very low concentration. You then add a large amount of DNA ligase, and the trick is that you can, in principle, ligate together DNA fragments which are held on the same chromatin fragment. And so that gives you an idea. And then you can show by, by PCRing across ligation joins that, that particular bits of chromatin were closely connected in the original cells before you did all this hideous um, manipulation. And so in this case, we've looked at uh, an SRVCI gene called FMP27, which is one of the longest. It's the second longest gene in SRVCI. It's about, it's about um, 9 kb, I think. And we showed early on, in fact, it was one of the first genes we looked at, and, and Mike Hampsey also did the same, that FMP27 forms a, a 5 prime, 3 prime interaction when you turn on transcription. We, we, we had to muck around with it because FMP27 is actually on all the time, but the promoter was replaced with a GAL promoter by... Um, Kevin Struhl, and we got the strain off him with some reluctance <laughs> on his part. <laughs> um, so um, the other problem with 3C is it ends up being a PCR experiment. You look for 3C products by PCR, and as we all know, you can PCR up anything you want if you have enough cycles of amplification. And with 3C analysis, you don't get a lot of ligation products, so you have to do hideously high amounts of amplification, which means anybody who's a bit sloppy in the lab will get a product, come what may. And so you really do probably nowadays need to try and use quantitative PCR techniques. And so in this case, we've used um, 
Tacman primers and um, tried to make it thoroughly quantitative. And it, 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 it's really very convincingly um, clear from this uh, uh, quantitative 3C analysis that um, you get an interaction between the anchor primer or the first primer and primer 5 and virtually no interaction on either side in 4 and 6. So there really is a peak of interaction between the promoter and the poly-A signal region. And with SUSE72 mutated, so it's, a, it's an essential gene, but a temperature-sensitive mutant called SSU72-2, when you raise the temperature to a non-permissive level, then you completely wipe out the 3C interaction. So it, it's, it's clear that SUSE72 is required for this process. Um, okay, so, but I'm talking here about polymerase direction, directionality, right? So let's, let's, uh, let's think about that a bit more. So um, many of you will have noticed um, last year or the year before, there are a whole series of papers which um, were all in general based on um, trans transcriptomic analysis, which came up with the view that um, there's an enormous amount of transcription activity around promoters, even when the promoters are turned off. And this transcription activity goes in both directions. You get... Um, you get uh, transcription initiating on a promoter both in this direction and in that direction. Of course, where you have two functional messages in both directions, then the transcription in both directions is a good idea. You're making two messages. But when there's only one message in one direction, you're still making a lot of transcription going in the other direction. And in, in yeast, these sorts of transcripts, which are really not coding for anything, they're, they're, they're non-coding RNAs, they're called cuts in, in SRVCI. And you detect them really only by knocking out the exonuclease ap apparatus, which normally degrade these, these funny uh, non-coding RNAs. And so cuts are detectable by looking at, uh, at yeast strains where you have mutations in the exosome, which is the main degrading apparatus of the, of the nucleus. Okay, so that was the kind of the background. And so what I wondered, or what I kind of hoped might be the case, was that maybe gene, lo gene loops were tied up with this. And so if, so if you disrupt gene loops, maybe you'll get more of these of these non-coding RNAs running in the wrong direction. And the bottom line is that's exactly what you see. Um, so <laughs> you can see for the next 10 minutes if you want. <laughs> um, and so the first thing that Yergi did, and this, this was Yergi the, the Frenchman, um, was he did a, a genetic sort of um, synthetic uh, sort of uh, interaction screen. So he shows here that, that um, at uh, uh, an almost permissive temperature, 32 degrees, you still get regular growth um, of, uh, of this SSU72-2 strain um, uh, under these particular lab conditions. And the same thing is true of, of a knockout of the RRP6, which is, a, which is a key component of the exosome. But if you combine the two SSU72 and RRP6 together, you get, a, you get a severe growth defect, which says that there may be some genetic interaction between the exosome and SSU72, which wasn't previously appreciated. So what might that interaction be? Well, um, we then went back to FMP27. You remember this gene I just showed you? And we asked what happens in terms of transcriptions that's going in the, in the wrong direction, the so-called cut direction. And basically what, what uh, Yergi and Sumo showed was that when you knock out SUSE72, you don't really significantly affect the level of FMP27 messenger RNA made. So this is, this is an RT-PCR on the five prime end of FMP27. But what you do clearly see is a significant sevenfold increase in the level of the transcript going in, in, in the wrong direction. And what we've done here is we've, we, we, we simply knocked out this, this critical factor for loop formation. Of course, it does do other things. It affects CTD phosphorylation. So there could be some other effects than gene looping going on here. But it's, it's certainly consistent. And this, 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 of course, was just, just the one gene, which for me is always enough. <laughs> but you need to do the whole genome these days, of course. Um, so we started doing a whole genome. And so, so this, is, this, this is perhaps the most visual kind of uh, transcriptome analysis I, I've, I've seen. And, uh, and this is, this is, this is, this is a, a series of tiling arrays that Lars Steinmetz has made. Some of you may have seen some of his data. So he basically has tiling arrays, very, very high density, all the way across the SRVCI genome on both strands. And so you can basically look across the whole genome. And where you get a blue signal, there is a significant level of transcription. And where you get a yellow signal, there's no transcription. And so here we are just in a kind of randomly selected part of the genome. And you can see that there are, there are, there's a gene here and here running on, on the top strand, and, and two genes in tandem running on the lower strand. And um, what we have then is wild type, which is the lowest, the lowest part of the array. And then we have SSU72 
alone as a knockout, RRP6 alone as a knockout, and then both together as a double knockout. And they're all done in duplicates. So it's all very visual and very clear, I think. And so just focusing on this transcript here. This transcript here is, is anti-sense to HSM3. Okay, so it's going in the other way, away from HSM3. You, and, and it's clear that it only really shows, it's obviously not, not as high a signal as you're getting from the, from, the, from the regular message, although it's not bad based on the level of blue color. And you're only seeing it when you combine SSU-72 and RRP6 together. So this looks like it's a new transcript that wasn't picked up in the original, simply knocking out the exosome type of transcriptome analysis. So it, it looks like here's, here's a case of another one of these funny transcripts that's being induced by knocking out, maybe looping, or knocking out SSU-72 anyway. So we, so we just went through the whole genome, but I won't show you the whole genome, you'll be relieved to hear, but I'll show you, show you a few more, because this is rather pretty, isn't it? So here we have another case. Can you, can you, can you spot the um, antisense SSU-72 stimulated transcripts? So here we have two quite highly transcribed genes on this strand, at least particularly this one, MSN5, which is very blue colored. And then on the other strand, there's nothing across here, but then you do see these signals here, which I put a box around. And you can see that this signal here in particular is antisense to MSN5. And you pick it up with SUSU72 alone in this case. You don't even need to knock out the exosome. It, it, it doesn't look any stronger when you knock out the exosome. And here you have one which is not quite so significant, but it's certainly above background, which, which, which comes from the antisense direction of this promoter. Again, it's only showing up when you knock out the exosome and SSU72. And so we, we've been through the whole genome. Rather, in fact, Yergi had to do it all manually because it turned out that the bioinformatics people didn't have the right program so to do what he wanted to do. So he spent about two weeks in front of a computer looking at one gene after the other all the way across the genome. Um, here's another example. It gets a bit boring, doesn't it? But you can see, I mean, here, here, here's a massively expressed gene. And here's the antisense coming across, which again really only shows up when you knock out both. So it, we, we basically opened up a whole new set of non-coding RNAs by knocking out SSU72 that come away from the promoter when you, uh, I, I, and it looks like it's, well, at least the hypothesis is it may be tied up with gene looping. Right. So that's the hypothesis. If, that make a, the, yes. The, the level, the basal level, that there is yellow, no? Yeah. What do you mean? There is nothing? There's nothing. There nothing. Ye yellow is nothing. Um, blue is something. And then the darker the blue, so the, the more the, hits, basically. The opposite transcript is zero when the loop is, is formed. I mean, I mean, over here, you mean? Yeah, yeah, there's essentially, there's essentially yeah, nothing. Yeah, yes, in general, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, in some cases you do pick up antisense appearing in the gene as well. I mean, we've, I've just shown you a few examples here, which of course make the point I'm trying to make. But you do actually find, when you knock out SUSE72, some, some, some actual new promoters from within the middle of genes. It's, it's not so common, but you do see them. Um, and yeah. OK, so the idea is obvious that if you knock out the loop, you, you generate more of the cut. And because we're picking up these transcripts... Now, why do you see more of the cut? So cut, you generate cut. That's my question. I mean, more of the cut means that there was some cut before. Okay. Um, in, the case, in the case of... Well, uh, to start with, we're not calling these cuts now. We're calling these SATs. For, for <laughs> SSU-72 associated transcripts. <laughs> and SATs you only see if you knock out SSU-72. But, but, but sometimes they become stronger if you also knock out the exosome because they're probably being degraded by the exosome as well in many cases. But yeah, I mean, if you look at, to answer your question directly, I mean, you simply can't see this signal here at all in wild type. It's not there. It shows up when you knock out SSU-72 in the exosome. Likewise, I forget where the hits were now. No, 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 yeah, I mean, it's pretty clear here. It's very clear. Anyway. Um, like uh, GAL1, for instance. Um, I mean, they're basically transcribing anyway, so if you knock out SUSE72, you're not going to see any, any more transcription above the background, probably, in this, this, this analysis. Is that, is, that, is that your question? I'm just wondering if the regulation <coughs> of, of bidirectional transcription is by an absence of SSU72, and so the absence of it should have no effect. We think, we think that the... The type of antisense transcripts which you pick up by knocking out the exosome, but which you see when SSU72 is present, these are all naturally bidirectional, but the, but the wrong direction is degraded by the exosome, so you don't normally see it in wild type. But I'll come to that, because this is another point. Can that I cut the box on this 
Um, yeah, most of them, they do have tatter boxes. But there's no bias? Um, we haven't seen it, I don't think. I, again, the bioinformatics people who've done all this work, I think they've looked at that, but I'm not sure what the answer is. So with respect to the tatter? Yeah, tatter, tatter ought to give you more directionality, it's true. But then, of course, tatter itself is not terribly directional, if you think about it, because it's the same sequence on both strands. <laughs> um, so then the bioinformatics people got a hold of this data, and this is all done by um, a group in Cambridge, actually, in LMB, no, in the Sanger Center. Um, and so what we have here is just really just, just a quantitation of how many SATs they picked up altogether. And so you can see that across the genome, we're picking up 605 SATs as opposed to almost 2,000 cuts. So it's, it's really pretty common. And, and what's been done here is to score where the beginning sequence, the beginning transcripts of, the, of these SATs are with respect to the transcription start site of, of the ORF in the other direction, of the regular gene in the other direction. And you can see that they, they tend to all come from a window which is about sort of 100 or so bases away from the, from the regular promoter. In the case of SATs, you get quite a lot of peaks across the gene, which, which implies some level of internal initiation. So this, is, this, is, this, is bio, this is a bioinformatic analysis of all the data put together. So we're looking at lots and lots of different genes in this, in this graph. In the case of cuts, you don't really get anything initiating within the middle of the gene. You only tend to get signals um, which are coming away from the promoter. Um, but then what's, what's different between the promoters of SATs and cuts? That was a question that we obviously wanted to ask. And um, it looks like one of the differences is to do with um, histones, chromatin, as you might expect. <laughs> um, and so it seems as though, in general, transcripts, in general promoters which generate an antisense cut, I hear, the, um, the uh, histones in the promoter region tend to be very acetylated which sort of argues that these sorts of promoters are naturally open and are actively transcribing and capable of transcribing in both directions all the time in wild type. But of course, you don't want to make the cut and so the exosome is recruited to degrade it. Whilst in the case of SATs, um, it turns out that the promoter in, in the wild type situation is actually um, fairly repressed and is not acetylated. And so um, you only pick up the SATs when you increase, when you, when you, when you decrease the amount of Acetylation. So what we have here is a bioinformatic analysis, which looks to me like the two graphs are identical, but I'm told that this is deeply significant when you look at the whole genome. <laughs> but the bottom line is that um, the cuts um, are slightly displaced, so they have, they, have, they have more acetylation than the SATs. Okay? You have to say, I, uh, <laughs> what can I say? I'm told this is an amazing result. <laughs> well, I, have to, I have to bow to superior bioinformatic knowledge. Um, but, but anyway, apparently, apparently this is deeply significant. It's, it's, got, a, it's got a p value of something, you know. I'm not, I, I never quite know what a p value means, I'm afraid. I, I, I never did any stats at university, unfortunately. So anyway, it's very significant, anyway. Okay, so the, so the, so the bottom line is that, um, the bottom line is that in general, promoters which, which, which are wide open will tend to make a, a message in one direction and a cut in the other direction. For the promoters which tend to be more repressed, then you only get transcription in the right direction, but if you knock out SUSE 72, then it goes in the wrong direction, and, th and that's when you make the SAT. That, that's, that's my take on it. Okay, but we, we wanted to do the final key experiment, which was not to mutate SSU 72, but to try and block loop formation in CIS. So what happens if you knock out the poly A signal um, to disrupt the loop? Do you then get a SAT going in the other direction, or a cut going in the other direction? And um, the problem is you can't just remove the poly-A site because it, it, because it turns out in s cerevisiae that poly-A signals are very redundant. If you knock out one poly-A site, you just find another one almost immediately because it's just an AT-rich sequence, basically. And most of the s cerevisiae genome is, is AT-rich, or big chunks of it are. And so what we did was we used a trick, which was we'd, we'd already discovered for, for s cerevisiae termination that you can replace um, a poly-A site with an RNT1 cleavage site, and that promotes efficient termination but it's not a poly-A signal, and so you don't, you don't add a poly-A tail and um, do, a, do a regular sort of message, three pump information. But it still terminates efficiently when you have an RCS present. And so what you can see here then is that if you, if you replace the poly-A site of this, of this CYC1 gene, and this is now actually on a plasmid, this is not a genomic experiment, although we're doing genomic experiments at the moment, because I'm sure the referees at Nature will demand it. <laughs> we ain't done it yet. But anyway, on this plasmid, we have CYC1 in one direction, and, and, and in the other direction, it's all this plasmid vector sequence. But lo and behold, it makes a non-coding RNA, as so you'll see in a minute. Um, so if you, if you replace the poly-A site with RCS, then rather than getting a nice peak of 3C interaction between the promoter and the, and the terminator, 
you lose it. So, so you clearly lost the loop by having the RCS present. And then we had lots of sort of quantitative RT-PCR, but I then told you I get to go and do a northern block because I don't believe all these bars really. <laughs> and um, so he did that, and it's really very pretty. So, so here we have C by C1 message. So this is with the poly-A site present. If you have the RCS present, you don't make as much stable message because it doesn't have a poly-A tail, so it's turned over more rapidly. Although this was done in an exosome deleted mutant, so it should be shouldn't be a big effect, but there clearly, is a, a, there clearly is less message, and furthermore, it's smaller in size because you're now cleaving a bit further towards the promoter. But then, amazingly, in this, in this piece of vector sequence, lo and behold, a little non-coding RNA showed up, which isn't, shouldn't really be there. It's, just, it's an artifact in a sense, but it's clearly making a short transcript. And um, lo and behold, um, you make quite a bit more of it, like two or threefold more, when you have RCS versus poly-A. So this certainly fits with our, our idea that it's the loop itself that's important, not just factors which may affect looping as well as other things. And so the model then is really self-evident, which is we think that the point of gene loops is to tell the polymerase which way to go, provides directionality. And if it doesn't have the benefit of forming loops, then the polymerase is much more promiscuous and will transcribe in both directions. And obviously this is only an SRA I would like to do the same thing in in a human cell, and we'll probably do that one day. Maybe we should talk about HIV, Mara. <laughs> um, if you still work on HIV, maybe you don't yeah, anymore. <laughs> I'm sure Marina does. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you remember that, but uh, 15 years ago there were uh, a couple of papers on antisense uh, transcripts from the... Oh, yeah, I, I, was, I was thinking about this on, on the airplane. I think, you can discuss it. Yeah, I think there's some interesting possibilities there. I have got another story, and I, I said it's going to... Um, it's, but it's, 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 it's Monica. <laughs> the, story is, the, story isn't, the story isn't Monica. The story is about Monica's research. <laughs> but she, she is. She is a, well, I, I gave a talk in Kelspring Harbor and I showed the same picture. And I said, I'm going to show you some beautiful work from Monica. And actually, she's also very beautiful herself. <laughs> and I was told that was outrageous and I couldn't say that. And it's, and it's very, very sexist. It's politically incorrect. But anyway, you can. Well, this is Monica Gullerova. And she does look like that in the lab. Yeah. Anyway. Moni, Moni's done a series of amazing experiments, pretty much single-handed, and um, I'm just going to run through them. So I, I go back to orientation, gene orientation, and, um, and we're now in S. Pombi, although we don't think, well, it, it may matter for this project, it probably does. So as I've said already, genes can be divergent, they can be tandem, they can be convergent, and Monica really totally by chance when she came to my lab worked on convergent genes. It turns out in S. Pombi that not many genes have been studied at all, and there are two genes called NMT1 and NMT2, which are very nice genes because they're very highly expressed and they're very tightly inducible by the, by the absence of thiamine. So NMT stands for no message thiamine. <laughs> Just terribly, it's not quite as exciting as a sort of a nice Drosophila gene name like it could be called, you know, I don't know, serendipity or something. <laughs> so that's called NMT. Anyway, it turned out that NMT1 and NMT2 are convergent, and that led Monica to a series of really very nice experiments which we published uh, um, last year. So what she basically showed was that um, most genes in, in, S, in S. Pombi, as in any other eukaryote, start at the promoter and stop at the terminator. But much to our puzzlement initially, we showed at least for NMT1 and NMT2, which turn out both to be convergent with their downstream gene partner, that in fact transcription didn't stop at the poly site, but it read all the way through. But the amazing thing was it only read all the way through in a particular phase of the cell cycle. It reads through in G1 when there's only one copy of the, the genome, but not in G2 when there are two. And this led to a whole series of experiments which we published uh, last two years ago now, it turns out, in Cell. Um, and basically what Moni showed was that um, convergent genes in G1, as I said already, give you this read-through transcription. I'm sorry, you can't see the top transcript, but it's there. And this read-through transcription makes double-strand RNA and um, we show that double-strand RNA really was being made because if you knock out the RNAi pathway, you have a dramatic phenotype. Um, and so she showed that this double-strand RNA that's made is, is processed by um, the AGO1 containing Ritz complex in the nucleus and by DICER in the nucleus to, to make siRNAs, which then induce heterochromatin across this convergent gene pair. In fact, the heterochromatin is quite precisely localized just over these two genes, these two convergent genes. And this heterochromatin actually recruits um, not only SWI6, but also the cohesin ring, which is involved in, in, in holding together sister chromatins in G2, 
In fact, in fact, when I say it recruits it, that, that's a little bit of a contentious statement. Um, it, 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 it helps the recruitment of cohesin, but cohesin is probably initially recruited by another complex called the cohesin loading complex, which itself is probably brought to heterochromatin by interactions in some way with, with either SWI6 or H3K9 trimethylation, which is the methyl mark for heterochromatin. Anyway, so this is all happening in S phase, we think, although you can't really do experiments in S phase because it's too complicated and too much of a black box to do any biochemistry. But anyway, once you, once you get into G2, then the cohesin is clearly in place. And then the amazing thing is that um, the polymerase now starts to transcribe. I forgot to mention, the heterochromatin is very transient. The, the methyl mark on the H3K9 is removed rapidly after S phase by, 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 by a demethylase, which we think we've identified. It's called epi-1 in, in, in S. pombi. And so you quickly lose the heterochromatin mark. So the polymerase is now free to start transcribing. But because cohesin has now been loaded onto this region, cohesin is now pushed into the middle, we think, by transcription. And this is very much the model that, for instance, a man called Frank Ullman has put about, about the way cohesin operates. And so we think that cohesin is then pushed into the middle of this convergent gene pair. And that stops the polymerase from, that, that effectively terminates the polymerase. So you, so you no longer make double-strand RNA. So you now go back to a sort of ordinary transcription profile. But, but when you get to the end of the cell cycle, of course, you now break the cohesin. That's the classic separase activity that cleaves the cohesin. And so now you can make read-through transcripts again. So it's a very nice cycle. So you can see it's very beautiful experiments. Um, anyway, so Monica's taken this to another, another level now. Um, so first of all, we, we asked, what do you require for this trans... It was, it was kind of a shock in the field, this, because people thought heterochromatin in Pombi, at least, was just on centromeres and telomeres and the silent mating locus. But what Monica's database has said is that there's these patches of heterochromatin throughout the genome, but it's very transient. It's only present in G1. And I should mention in S. Pombi, G1 is a very short period of time. It's only about 10 minutes. So nobody's seen it before because they wouldn't... You look at a whole population of cells, it's mainly G2. You don't see these very transient marks. Um, so, but Monica showed that... Um, well, I won't go into this. Let's, let's carry on. So just, just to take you around the cell cycle in a different cartoon. So here we have the double-strand RNA made in G1 from convergent genes. Um, it's then processed by Dicer and Ritz. It puts on the heterochromatin mark because Ritz recruits the H3K9 methylase activity called CLA4. You, probably none of you know your POMBI, do you very well? But anyway, there's a methylase which puts on this mark, which is the heterochromatin mark. And once you've got the H3K9 methyl mark on, then you recruit the POMBI homologue of HP1. You've all heard of HP1 because that's mammalian. Well, a SWI6 is the, the name for HP1 in POMBI. And, and so SWI6 is in place, cohesin is in place. Um, if you think about it, you have to remove the, the, the positive marks on H3K9 because H3K9 will normally be acetylated when the genes are being transcribed. And so you need a deacetylase. So that's what SIR2 is doing. So we show that SIR2 is required for this process as well. And then, and then EP1 is important now to remove the methyl marks, which now changes from a, a, a red lollipop, which is the negative mark, to a, a po positive green lollipop, which is the positive mark. So now transcription can occur. And I, this is really what I just said already, isn't it? Just in a different cartoon form. OK, so what's new? Well, what's new is Monica was sort of looking at her, her genes, as one does, and um, sh she noticed a rather interesting fact, which is that there's a whole series of genes in S. S Pombi involved in the RNAi process, and they're listed here. There are actually five RNAi complexes uh, of uh, the subunits are indicated here, but all these subunits are encoded for by genes, and what's very striking is most of these genes are themselves convergent. I mean, it's really quite significant. It's, it's about 80% of RNAi genes are a conversion, which is much higher than the random 25% you'd expect to find. And furthermore, some of the really key players like Dicer and... Um, where's Dicer? Somewhere there. There, at the top. That's where <laughs> Dicer is, is, is clearly convergent and AGO1. There's only one argonaut protein in Pombi called AGO1, and that's convergent. So Monica wondered whether the fact that these RNAi genes were convergent was in some ways an autoregulatory trick. And the bottom line is it is. So you can all go and have you want because that's really the story. Um, but I'll show you a bit more. OK, so um, because you form this transient heterochromatin in G1, heterochromatin, of course, reduces transcription. 
And so we, we expected to see that the level of transcripts, if you measure the level of transcripts in G1 versus G2, that if, if you have a convergent gene, the level of transcription should go down in G1 because it's heterochromatin at that stage. And this is exactly what she shows. So for all of these convergent RNAi genes um, in, 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 in G1S, the black bar, you have less message than you do in, in, in G2, which is the, the, the gray bar. And of course, you have to remember that message has a, a finite half-life, and that'll probably extend beyond the cell cycle to some extent. And so if you're looking at steady state RNA, you may not get as big an effect as you get if you looked at nascent transcripts. But there's clearly a drop in the level of message in this very short period of the cell cycle. And if you look at tandem genes, there's no change at all. Obviously, we're, we're normalizing this to some standard. I forget what standard it was now. I have to ask Monica. Um, if you look at the protein levels for these, com for these convergent RNAi gene expression products, then they all go down a bit. But again, there's a problem of protein stability. But if you look at AGA1, it's clearly going down a bit. RIC1 is going down a lot. But they, they all go down a bit as compared to these two genes, which are tandem controls, which don't change at all. And we, we quantitated this quite carefully. So we're sure that there is a drop in the level of protein as well. So just to remind you of the cartoon again. Oh, man, that's the first time I've shown it, actually, is it? Okay, so, so here we have a chromosome. Um, um, the telomeres and the centromeres have heterochromatin and cohesin, indicated by these, these red blobs. And we also show that convergent genes have this patch of heterochromatin, which is, which is only present in G1 to S. Um, but now, <laughs> a funny thing about the centromeric heterochromatin, which is the heterochromatin in Pombe, which has been the most heavily investigated, is although it's permanently heterochromatin, in fact, in order for heterochromatin to be heterochromatin, it has to be transcribed at some point because you have to make double-strand RNA to make it into heterochromatin. <laughs> and it turns out that what actually happens in centromeric heterochromatin is that there's a brief window of time, actually in G1 to S, when it is being transcribed to make double-strand RNA, which then reconverts the centromere back into deep heterochromatin for, the, for, the, for most of the cell cycle. So there is a period of a brief window of time when, when centromeric heterochromatin is being transcribed. And this was, this was described by these two labs um, a couple of years ago now. And so Monica also did some more experiments looking at RNAi genes, um, in this case looking at transcription. And you can see that proportionally there's, um, as you'd expect, much more polymerase on these convergent genes in G2 when they're being transcribed than in G1 when they're not being transcribed. And this is the direct opposite of the centromere. This is really what, what they, they, they showed in those two papers. So the centromere has been transcribed only for a brief period. Hang on, what am I, what am I trying to say here? There is polymerase present. <coughs> Normally there's no polymerase on centromeric heterochromatin because it's not being transcribed, but in this brief period in G1S it is being transcribed um, most, most, most of the, virtually all the polymerase you can detect on centromeres is only present over G1S. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, if you look at tandem genes, there's no change between G1S and G2, as you'd expect. Uh, so I think I'll, what's this? This, this? this is just to show that, um, as you'd expect, we know that convergent genes make double-strand RNA, which is recognized by the RNA, RNAi apparatus in G1S. And so you can chip AGO1 to convergent genes, but not to tandem genes. So that this is all, these are all just more controls, which I don't, you don't need to see at this point in time. But, OK, so, so we had all this data. So, so we knew that RNAi genes were generally convergent. We knew that they were downregulated, like all convergent genes in G1S. And it, it immediately seemed logical to us that if you're downregulating the RNAi apparatus in G1S, that's exactly when the centromeric heterochromatin needs to be transcribed so that it can be heterochromatin for the rest of the cell cycle. And so we thought that th this was a neat mechanism whereby you reduce the level of the RNA apparatus in G1S so that the centromeres could be allowed to transcribe for a little bit so that they could then be repressed for the rest of the cell cycle. You're putting a long face here. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, but of course the problem with all these experiments is, and, and, and we, we sent this stuff to Nature too at some point, <laughs> and they said this is all very, very well, but you have to do an experiment, you have to manipulate the genome. If you really think convergent genes matter, what happens if AGO1 is not convergent anymore? What happens if DICER isn't convergent anymore? Does this change the regulation? And amazingly, it does. <laughs> so Monica went to Harvard and worked with a very talented Pombi lab run by Danish Mozad, who anybody in the field would know very well. Um, and what she did um, was simply to target 
Euro 4, which is a, a nice gene to target because it, it, it gives you a selectable mark, it's a, it gives you a Euro positive mark and a Euro minus background. And she targeted it between AGA1 and the convergent pair MMI1 in this case. And she put it in such a way that it becomes, in such a way that Euro 4 is now tandem with AGA1 whilst it becomes convergent with MMI1. And so you essentially switch the AGA from being convergent to being tandem. Okay? And so we call this TAGO. <laughs> And she did the same thing with Dicer and the same thing with, with another one, CLAR4, and she got the same results. And so what you, what you immediately see, amazingly, is that um, with AGO and Dicer, in the wild type situation, when they are regularly convergent, you can see that in, in G1S you get these read-through transcripts picked up by three prime rays here, very clearly, for, for AGO and Dicer in the wild type situation. In G2 you just get it terminating at the first poly A band, but then when you look at TAGO or T Dicer, you don't get the difference. <laughs> so it's amazing. Orientation switches whether or not it terminates. Which I, I, find, I find that an amazing result. Because <laughs> um, it, the Tega has exactly the same cis sequences around the gene. None of the poly signals have been changed. None of the termination signals, as far as I know, have been changed. But just the orientation with respect to the next gene. And then in terms of regulation, well, as you'd expect, um, when, you, when you make AGO into TAGO, um, then the level of AGO1 message in um, G1, which is normally lower by a, a factor of two or so in this RT-PCR, it now becomes even. And if, if you look at MIM, MIM1, um, what happens? MIM1 remains downregulated in both AGO and TAGO because it's, it's convergent in both cases, essentially. And then if you look at Euro 4, Euro 4 naturally is a tandem gene, so it shouldn't be regulated in this way. But when you put it into the position between AGO1 and MMI1, it then becomes, um, it becomes downregulated in G1 as it's, as, it's, as it's become a conversion G. Okay? And um, you, get, you, you get a bit of a, a change in the level of protein as well by swapping around the orientation. And um, then she went on to look at the centromere. So, so we know that the centromere um, is transcribed in the G1S phase. So here is a centromeric transcript wild type giving you a significant RT-PCR signal. But with TAGO, you lose this, this um, level of, um, of G1-specific um, centromeric transcript. So this argues that by no longer down-regulating AGO in G1 to S, you no longer get the window of opportunity to transcribe the centromere. So, so it's now... It's, it's now kept at a lower level, okay? These transcription effects all seem fairly minor. They're like twofold, threefold maybe at best. So you might say, well, is this really significant? And there's more data to show you, which I won't show you. But you get a phenotype. That's the amazing thing. So looking at, looking at cells under the microscope, which, which again, this is a good reason for, the, for Monica to go to the Mozart lab, because they're very good at looking at, looking at POMBI under a microscope. And so it's, it's clear that um, POMBI wild type gives you these nice sort of uh, cylinders and Tago and T-Dice are both, they're kind of a bit stunted and a bit fatter. And interestingly, T-N-M-T-2, because we also turn that around, but, 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 that, but, but that isn't an RNAi gene, so it shouldn't do anything, and it doesn't. It looks just like a wild type in terms of its appearance. Um, CLAR4 also gives you, when it's turned around, a funny appearance. So they're all giving you a weird shape. And then if you, if, if you stain DNA during mitosis, then what you tend to get in wild type is, is you get a clear, rapid separation of the two... Um, sister chromatids in mitosis. But what happens with TAGO and T-Dicer and T-CLAR4 is that there's a reluctance for the two DNAs to come apart. So they get kind of caught up together. And if, if, if you do sort of if you look at this statistically, looking at lots of different nuclei, it's very clear that you get a much higher rate of failure to resolve the sister chromatids in mitosis. So there's a real phenotype. It's just turning around a gene and affecting the level of expression by a factor of two steady state is giving you this phenotype. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> um, and so really what her data now says is, is that we think that there's auto-regulation of RNAi genes whereby convergent RNAi genes are active in all of G2. They're expressed at full amounts. But then in G1, you get double-strand RNA being made because they're convergent genes. And then it's turned off for a brief period of time. And that brief period of time is the exact period of time when the centromeres need to be no longer repressed, but now need to be being transcribed. And so the RNA, RNA apparatus is depleted to allow them to be transcribed. Um, so that's the, that's, that's the basic idea. So, um, 
that's pretty much the end of the talk. Um, the only thing I might just quickly throw at you as a final little bit of data is you could say, okay, well, you have, you have these conversion genes with little patches of heterochromatin, but what's the point? Why not just, why isn't it enough just to have heterochromatin there, there, and there? Why do you have to have little patches elsewhere? And of course, the point of heterochromatin in terms of mitosis is, is, is one of alignment because the heterochromatin recruits cohesin, which holds the chromosomes in place or aligns them. And um, we wondered whether the convergent gene heterochromatin that's formed on the arms might be important as a way of allowing alignment of the chromosomes all the way along the chromosome, not just at the centromeres and the telomeres. And so Monica did some fish experiments. She, she, she likes to travel around the world. <laughs> so she went to Japan for these experiments uh, because it turns out that doing DNA fish in Pombi is quite tricky. And there's a gentleman called Yanagida in, in uh, Kyoto. Um, well, actually, I think he's, he's, he's in several labs. He's, he's, he's about 80 now, I think. And he's, he's, he's had to retire from his regular job, but he has other labs elsewhere that he, he goes to now. <laughs> anyway. Yanagida um, let Monica do some experiments in his lab, fish experiments, and here she is. She had a brief period uh, speaking to a Kyoto, uh, speaking to a, what are these girls called? Geisha, Geisha girls, that's right, yes, Geisha girls, that's right. She, she's a tourist briefly. Um, anyway, so she did these fish experiments, and of course they're, they're, they're very pretty experiments because what she has is a, a probe across one convergent gene pair in, um, and, and these are all G2 cells where there should be, where there are two copies, right? And so you can only see one single dot for this convergent gene pair, which argues that the cohesin is, is holding together the two, the two sister chromatids at this position. Um, but then if you, if, you, if you take a region of, of the chromosome which doesn't have any cohesin for a while because there are no conversion genes, then you get two dots. This is a blow up. So you get one dot. So you simply you score one dots and two dots as to whether you have cohesion. And then she did sort of, she did quantitation and showed that this was really significant. But whenever you had a conversion gene pair, that bit of the chromosome came together and gave you just a single dot signal. And then she looked at mutants. So if you, if you mutate um, the cohesin loading complex, then rather than being one dot, it becomes two dots. And so it's, it's, it's clear that the, the um, arm, it's clear that the, that the heterochromatin, which then recruits, that then recruits cohesin to these convergent gene pairs, is actually involved in holding together the chromosomes all the way along the length of the chromosome. And although this may not be important for mitosis, as long as you hold it in a few places, maybe you'll get mitosis to work all right, although the, the, the cell biology I just showed you argues is not all right. Um, but you can imagine that in terms of repairing homologous chromosomes by homologous recombination, having a perfect alignment in G2 is a very good idea, and that's probably what Pombi does it for. So that's the end of the story. So I'm going to stop there. Um, so what I've tried to tell you today is about two things, and I thought it would happen in one hour. <laughs> it's gone on a bit longer, I'm sorry. Um, so I told you about gene loops, and we think that gene loops may be particularly important, at least in S. cerevisiae, to give you um, polymerase polarity or, 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 or directionality, if you like. Um, then in terms of... Um, Tandem versus convergent genes. We, we know that tandem genes, when they, when they don't terminate, you get interference. But we know with convergent genes, at least in S. pombi, if, if, uh, they, they actually don't terminate intentionally. In G1, they read across each other, make double-strand RNA, which then gives you this whole regulatory network, which I just described. So here we are. So at the very end, um, I'd just like to thank my, my group for all their hard work and the Wellcome Trust for giving me money and Cancer Research UK. And uh, I have a big grant in with the Wellcome Trust at the moment. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Times are hard in the UK. I don't know whether you've heard that, but <laughs> um, maybe they'll give me some more money. I hope so. Um, some of you know some of the people here, and the ones that, the, these people aren't all in my lab at the moment. Some of them have left. So just to give you a kind of a, a geography of where they've gone. So Hannah Misho, whose work I didn't talk about, she's she's now got a, a, a welcome postdoctoral fellowship, and she's she's going to go to to Basel shortly to um, Susan Gass's lab. Anna Rondon, who did some of the early work I showed in my talk, she's back in Seville. She has a position there. Uh, Kelly Birkin, some of you know, she's in Oxford. She has sort of her own position, and she's still negotiating, you know, her future to some extent. Um, Steve West, um, he, he's, he's running his own lab in Edinburgh now, next to David Tolovy. Sadly, I lost him. And Hashia, as I've already explained, has, 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 has jumped the fence, and rather than sending out papers of genes and development, she's sending, <laughs> sending them back from genes and development. <laughs> so on that note, I'll stop. Thank you very much. <laughs>